So I told Pastor Jonathan, he said, yeah, that's $180, bike, $180 per bike. That comes out to 44.4 bike if they raise $8,000. So one will be a tricycle. All right? All right. Hey, if you have your Bibles, if you can open them to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to be reading out of the Amplified and have the Amplified up here. If I could ask my wife, hand me my... Yeah, sorry, Pastor. Thank you so much, my dear. Thank you. So, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And I need to. So, y'all just remember this when you come back up, worship team, that I unplug that. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to get into this scripture in just a minute, and I want to give you a little history lesson. How many of y'all know history is good? Anybody? History is good. When we went to, um, when I went to see my daughter over in the Netherlands, I said, hey, you know, I got to go see something historical. So we just kind of looked up things. I went to see the old churches. I got to go to Dunkirk um, because uh, I just enjoy seeing things like that. You know, people uh, do extraordinary things, do they not? And so uh, I just want to go and kind of relive the past a little bit. And sometimes people don't do very extraordinary things. They do bad things. So we can relive that past as well um, because it is an example to us. And Paul kind of addresses that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He kind of begins to go back through some of the things that they've been going through. But we're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. But the first thing that I want to do is tell you this. Um, how many of y'all remember this from your history class? How many of y'all remember Patrick Henry, March 23rd, 1775, he um, gave a speech, uh, kind of an impromptu speech, give me what, liberty or give me, now his speech was given at the uh, second Virginia convention, it was said to be a decisive event uh, and to gather the vote, to gather the troops against the upcoming uh, against the British in the upcoming Revolutionary War. There were two uh, gentlemen who were at this particular speech and at this convention. Those were George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, who would later also be presidents of the United States. Henry began his speech by saying this. He said, he stated that his respect for, he had respect for his opponents in the debate. I want you to kind of hear this is Paul speaking to the church today. But at the same time, listen to what Henry said. He said he stated the respect for his opponents in the debate. He defined them as highly patriotic and competent. Nevertheless, he said, people are entitled to their own perspectives on a subject and should be able to express them freely. So he compares the question of whether to assemble troops to a choice between freedom and slavery arguing that he cannot keep his feelings bottled up inside, lest he later be guilty of treason against the Union and God. Let me ask you a question. I mean, wouldn't it be great if we as pastors always came to the pulpit and say, hey, I know I need to speak the Word of God because I do not want to be disloyal to God the Father. Amen? Amen? So Henry says now, he said this, he said, for it is natural for men to want to maintain hope, even illusionary, about the fate of their nation. However, he condemns the current case where false hope, listen to what he says, false hope has blinded men. He said that there has been a false hope that they have grabbed that has blinded men from seeing that the liberty, their very liberty is being threatened. Then he says this, he prioritized knowing the truth. Do you hear that? Knowing the truth, even if painful, over ignorance, or as Paul addressed it many times in his letter, he would say, I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, or unlearned. He said, he prioritized knowing the whole truth, even if painful, over ignorance, because knowledge leads to tools which improve one's condition. Now, I want you to listen to what 
at the very end of this, and this was a summary of the speech, because what is interesting is, is no one was ever able to find exactly the exact copy that Patrick Henry read when he read this. It was not until about 25 years later that they were able to find something that was similar to that because many who were there could recollect what the speech was about. But listen to this. It says that his speech was highly rhetorical. In other words, it went over and over again. He employed a degree of intentional redundancy to drive home the message that he desired. Do you hear that? A continued... Um, implication again and again of the same truth that he wanted to drive forward. Have you ever read the Bible and wonder, why does it say that again? I just read that. Has anybody ever done that? Why does it say that again? Well, it says it again and again and again because, believe it or not, God's trying to drive in a point. Amen? He's trying to get us to see the whole truth. Now, if we'll look very quickly at, at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, I've entitled this because at the beginning of the Amplified Version, here is what the title is of this particular chapter. Take care with your liberty. And the message, chapter 8, is entitled this, Freedom with Responsibility. Now, this was the Apostle Paul in A.D. 54 and 55, it's when they said that he actually brought these particular truths or this particular letter to Corinth or sent it to them. So here's what I've entitled our message. Give me liberty, question mark, or give me death. Let's pray. Father, we just ask for your word to illuminate us. God, just help us, Heavenly Father, to hear your word, to know your truth, Lord God. I pray, God, that you will open your word up to us and Lord, that there will be a free flow of your spirit in this place. God, unstop our uh, clogged up minds and our clogged hearts, Heavenly Father, so that we can hear what the spirit would say to the church today. And we ask you for it in Christ's name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. So, to this question, give me liberty or give me death, I think the Apostle Paul would answer this. Yes and yes. Did y'all hear that? How would he answer it? Yes, give me liberty. And yes, give me death. Yes and yes. I like how, um, you know, now when, when you get an email or you get a text message, it automatically will reply for you, especially with an email. Somebody actually sent me two questions in an email yesterday, and there was a reply down at the bottom. I didn't even have to do anything. It said yes and yes. I thought, man, this is awesome. I didn't even have to type it. I just clicked. So I think Paul would have just clicked. Give me liberty? Yes. Give me death? Yes. Now when we think about this, let me take you through just a few of these things. And I'm going to read a lot of scripture to you. So I hope you have your Bibles or you have it on your phone or you got it on something so that we can kind of read this together. Some of it will be on the screen. But when I take you to 1 Corinthians 10, you're going to need to have your word open. But the Apostle Paul would say yes to liberty, and he would say yes to death. In other words, yes, we have liberty in Christ, but also yes, Christ calls us to die. Get ready. Some of these are going to be painful for you. I think this next one's going to be painful. How about this? Yes, it's about me, and yes, no, it's not about me. It's not about me. Is it about me? It's about me, but yes, it's not about me. How about this? Yes, we are set free. And yes, we are now bond servants to Christ. We're indebted to the one who set us free. Amen? So listen to it again. Yes, we are set free. Yes, we have liberty. But yes, we're to die to our own agendas because now we're bond servants to Christ, we're indebted to the one who set us free. How about this? Yes, we are the sons and daughters of God with all rights and privileges. We love to preach that, don't we? And we love to hear sermons on that. I have the rights and the privileges. I'm a son and a daughter of God. Amen. 
All his promises are yes and they are amen. But yes, we are also responsible to set an example for those who are in the faith and those not yet in the faith. So here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul is writing these words. Here's what he says. Now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all, if I say all, have knowledge. We all have knowledge concerning this. Let me ask you a question. How many of y'all have been walking with the Lord more than 10 years? Slip your hand up. A lot of y'all. Almost all of you. Good. Okay. How many of y'all have been walking for um, 50 years or more? Man, look at that. That's pretty cool. Isn't it? I just wanted to check. All right. 50 years or more. Okay, so here's the thing, and I think that we've all seen this. I remember when I was a brand new Christian, I struggled. How many of y'all struggled when you were a brand new Christian? <laughs> How many of y'all had a hard time dying to the old life? Come on, that old life, boy, that old life didn't want to die, did it? There were so many things about that old life that did not want to die, but praise God, he brought us through those times, amen? Amen. But here it is. He says, about food sacrificed idols, he said, we all have knowledge concerning this. So now what Paul is doing is he is writing to the people. And if you'll remember from 1 Corinthians at the very beginning, Paul said, I, I should be addressing you as mature, but I am having to address you as babes. I should be feeding you meat, but I'm having to give you milk. So we understand something. Here's the thing. Paul is writing to people who should be thinking and behaving as mature believers. If y'all ever, you know, I mean, if you had a child and that child reached about four or five years old and, you know, they were just a normal everyday child. And by the time they were 20, they were still doing what they were doing at five years old. How many of y'all would say it is time for you to grow up? I remember one, one guy, he told uh, this story one time. He was talking about getting his kid to, to go and to do the things that he felt like he needed to do. And he said, he told his son, he said, listen, son, son didn't want to go to college. He said, that's okay. You got to get a job. He said, I'll tell you what, you got two months to get a job. I know you want to kind of enjoy your summer a little bit so you can do a few things. You can enjoy that. But at the end of two months, you need to have a job. By the end of the first month, the dad looked at the son and said, son, I hadn't heard anything about you making any applications. No, Dad, but I'm getting ready. Come on. Y'all know how kids are, right? I'm getting ready. I'm kind of warming myself up to the fact of getting a job. So he said to him about six weeks into it, he said, Hey, remember now, you only got a couple of more weeks. Oh, Dad, don't worry. I'm going to get a job. You know, I put a couple of online applications in. Y'all know what that means, right? And so then... At the end of the two months, his dad walks in one morning and said, pack your stuff, you're gone. Son woke up, he goes, what are you talking about? He said, I told you, two months, I ain't gotten a reply yet. Pack your stuff, you're gone. Now, how many of y'all would think, now that dad was hard. How many of y'all think, hallelujah. <laughs> now, golly, I'm glad I'm not your child. All right, but here we go. But Paul is writing to people who already ought to be acting mature. Amen? They ought to already be grown up. This church has been around five years. They've been walking in the word of God. And we understand this. They had sexual immorality that wasn't even named among the Gentiles. They had some of them who were wanting to go sleep with temple prostitutes. We looked at all of this. So Paul says this. He says, hey, about food sacrifice, we all have knowledge. Now, then verse 1 continues. Here's what it says. Out of the Amplified, knowledge alone makes people self-righteously arrogant. Woo! That's a mouthful right there, isn't it? Knowledge alone makes people self-righteously arrogant. So in other words, I can have knowledge. But I might just have knowledge so that I can display that knowledge. That doesn't mean that I'm even walking according to the knowledge, does it? Remember the Pharisees? And, and it always, in Matthew 19, when Jesus is, uh, they come to Jesus trying to trick him on marriage and divorce. 
You know, they try to trick him. They say, didn't Moses command a man to give his wife a certificate of divorce? Jesus said, no, he didn't command, he permitted. But understand this, they had knowledge, but they didn't have wisdom. Jesus had wisdom that was from heaven, amen? So when we see this, knowledge alone makes people self-righteously arrogant. When we look at this, look, knowledge has two defects. This is out of the Spirit-Filled Life Bible. It tends to center on itself, number one. And number two, it is inadequate as the bond in personal relationships. In other words, if I just have knowledge, if I just say to my wife, look, I love you, that ought to be enough. I'll be back in a year. This is going to be a great marriage. Now, if I said that now after 32 years of marriage, she would say, thank you for the break. Um, but, but, Karen said, come back in a year. Woo! But it's inadequate as a bond in personal relationships. Just knowledge isn't going to take you there, is it? But get this. In verse 1 is continued. It says, but love. Everybody say, but love. Come on. We know 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is a love chapter. But here he says, and it's almost like about food sacrificed to idols. Get, get how he says this. About food sacrificed to idols. <laughs> we all have knowledge concerning this. Knowledge puffs up. Makes you self-righteous, makes you centered on yourself. It doesn't bring any bond in relationship. And then he says, wait, but love. Isn't that something? Because so many times, and I don't know about you, but when I first came into Christianity, I wanted to know the right things to do, the wrong things to do. I mean, I kind of wanted to, to figure it all out. And I want to tell you something. If I had, a, had to live according to the law, I would, and, and would have been condemned according to the law, I would be dead right now. Because I broke the law. Would you not be dead right now? We would all be dead right now. Just admit it. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're lying if you don't say it. I'm telling you, you're lying and the truth is not in you. Because here's the thing, we can live with this knowledge, but it's the love of God that compels us. It's the love of God that draws us in. I never will forget, listen, the first time that I ever, and, and I just want to say that I stepped outside of the bounds. I, I feel like many times God's, God's banner over us is like an umbrella, okay? And I remember I was, I was uh, away on, a, on TDY, temporary duty assignment. I was in the military at the time. I'd come to Christ. On that particular trip, I, I found out that God could heal my headache. Because I was running around this place trying to find somebody to give me some aspirin. We didn't even have Advil at the time. What was ibuprofen? All right, so anyway, I was running around trying to find an aspirin. And I never will forget, I had this, you know, this everybody in there, no, we don't have any, no, we don't have any. I wasn't going to go to the, to the base um, exchange at that time. I was just the commissary. I said, no. So I just went into my room, and I, I knelt down, and I said, God, I have got a splitting headache. I don't know why in the world I had such a headache. But I, I've got a headache, so God, can you heal my headache? And the Lord healed my headache. I'm telling you, he took it away. Somebody came by, hey, I found some aspirin. I don't need it anymore. God healed my headache. Amen? So then, two days later, one of the friends that was stationed with me at my first particular place of duty, which was Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in North Carolina, he came knocking on my door. The guy was from New Hampshire. His name was Paul Rafferty. And he goes, newbie, because he talked with this nasally tone. I loved it, you know. He's from New Hampshire. It's Paul Rafferty. I said, hey, Paul. So he comes in. He's like, hey, you know, you still da-da-da-da-da partying and doing all these things because I party with him, party with his family, well, his, his wife. And, you know, we just had, you know, some uh, times that I can't even remember. So. But I remember Paul says, hey, we're going to a local club tonight. Do you want to come? And I'm telling you, it was like uh, just a, have you ever had that thing to where you go, that's not a good idea. That's not a good idea. 
I looked at Paul, and I told Paul what had happened. Hey, I got saved. I came to Christ. He's like, oh, man, come on. Go with us. Come on. We'll go shoot some pool. You know, we'll just go have a good time. Da, 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 da. Now, how many of y'all know that I shouldn't have gone? But I did. Because eventually I said, Paul, I'm going to go just because it's you. So I went. I got there. I knew I wasn't supposed to drink anything. I drank some. I didn't do anything else. Just drank, drank a couple of drinks. Went back. The next morning I woke up. I woke up with this real sober feeling. Because by this time in my walk with the Lord, I started to pray, read my word every day. Okay? I woke up, I looked over at my bedside, and there sat my little New Testament. Little green New Testament. They gave it to me when I was in boot camp. I looked over, saw my little New Testament, and I was like, God, I'm so sorry. I am so, I blew it yesterday. How did I blow that yesterday? God, I'm not going to blow it again. I'm not going to blow it again. But I remember something. I remember feeling not guilty. I remember feeling the love of God. I just remember God going, it's okay. I forgive you. And I just remember going, thank you, Lord. And then I'm telling you, it wasn't 10 minutes later. Newbie. <laughs> Paul comes knocking on my door. We're going to the club again tonight. Do you want to go? I said, no, I do not. And Paul, I'm not going. And I told him what happened. He said to me, hey, I appreciate you sharing that with me. And if that's how you feel, no pressure. Let's hang out later. Let's go grab something to eat. You don't have to go to the club with us. I mean, do you hear that? Now, I want to tell you something. When I got out of the military and got into ministry, Paul Rafferty came to my church. <laughs> he, we were charismaniacs, okay? You have charismatic churches. Our church was charismaniacs. That's what they called it. Somebody called us Six Flags Over Jesus, you know? They were like, man, that church is wild. So, man, like, worship was going, you know, the pastor would say pray, and buddy, when he said pray, everybody prayed. People were praying in the spirit, praying, lifting their hands. We got done with the service. I looked over at Paul. Paul's like, is there anywhere I can get a beer? That's exactly what he asked me. <laughs> I said, Paul, we just had church. He goes, I was waiting on the Blues Brothers to come flipping down the center of the aisle. I have never been in anything like this in my life. I said, but it was alive, wasn't it? He said, yeah, it was alive. I don't know what happened to Paul Rafferty. I'm going to trust the good Lord that he came to Christ. But the love of God compels us. I tell you that just to tell you that when I woke up that morning, the guilt and the shame and, and the remorse that I felt. But then immediately when I said, God, forgive me, the love of God overflowed me and filled me up. So listen to me. Love, but love. The unselfish, that unselfishly, that unselfishly, I apologize, seeks the best for others. That what? Come on. Wait. Come on. Help me. The love that what? Un selfishly seeks the best for that what unselfishly seeks the best for others look at your spouse that unselfishly <laughs> seeks the hey how about that love chapter that love chapter is no fun we read it at a wedding and then we hardly ever look at it again until we go to another wedding Love does not puff itself up. Love is not arrogant. Love is not rude. Love is not self-seeking. <laughs> you know what? We ought to just pull that out every week. Okay, what are our marching orders this week? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You can do that for the rest of your life. You could do it every day. And we won't live up to it except the love of Christ compels us. Amen? 
But the fact of the matter is, is that is a high call, is it not? But here it says, 1 Corinthians, I mean, 1 Corinthians 8, 1, but love that unselfishly seeks the best for others builds up and encourages others to grow in wisdom. Here's what we're to do. We're to seek the best for others. We're to build up and encourage each other to grow. I'm going to give you a few scriptures here really quick. First off, it's this. The principle, the obligations of love are the determining factor in questions of moral significance. In other words, Paul's saying this to the church. Look, he said it back in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He said, everything is permissible for me, but everything is not beneficial. In other words, I have freedom, but I also am restrained from exhibiting all of that freedom. He covers it again in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, I am constrained from doing everything because I know that it will not benefit other people. Do you all hear me? There are some things that I like to do, but I'm not going to do them if it's going to cause someone else to stumble. Amen? So the principle of love places limitations on one's liberty of conscience. 1 Thessalonians, let's talk about building up real quick. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says this, Therefore, encourage and comfort one another and do what? Build, one, build up one another just as you are doing. Acts 20, 32 says, So brethren, I commend you to God, and the word of his, his what? <laughs> Which is able to what? Build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. Listen to me. The next time that a word of condemnation comes, you say, I don't receive it because God's word to me is grace. Amen? It's grace. It's mercy. I never will forget, we had a guy that was saved when I was working at Griffin. He was saved. And uh, I was on staff there, and this guy wanted to get involved in our children's outreach ministry. He had a heart of gold. The guy still has a heart of gold. Wanted to get involved in that ministry. He had just gotten saved. He was a rough one. He was rough. He got saved. It wasn't three, four, maybe five, six months after he had applied we kept kind of going through because we had to do a background check and we had to do some other things. And listen, he was just growing in the Lord. But I remember on his background check, the police report came back and it tagged him that he had an outstanding warrant for him in the county that was beside us. He met me for lunch. I had to share it with him. You know, I figured I'd do it in a restaurant so he didn't hurt me. Um, I said, hey, hey, listen, I wanted to share this with you. He was like, what? I cannot believe this. Now, what am I going to do? I said, hey, wait, wait. I said, first off, this has been outstanding for a long time. <laughs> so obviously they hadn't found you yet. <laughs> Flee the country. That's what they're talking No, I said, <laughs> I said, they haven't found you. I said, obviously this isn't that huge of a deal. I said, but it's a deal. I said, look, here's what I feel like. I said, I had to do some of this same stuff. I said, you need to go and make this right. I need to what? I said, you need to go make it right. What do you mean I need to make it right? I said, go talk to the authorities. Tell them you have an outstanding warrant. Find out what you're supposed to do. Are you kidding me? They haven't found me yet. I said, look. <laughs> How many of y'all would have been thinking the same thing? I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> I ain't going nowhere. I tell you what, I'll watch your children's ministry. I'm not going to be involved. He goes, you know what? I'll do it. He went. He, I, I wrote a letter for him. Another pastor at the church wrote a letter for him. He took it to the judge that he had to go stand before. They didn't lock him up. They just said, hey, you need to appear in court. This is a charge. He took letters. The judge, here's what the judge said. What are you doing here? He said, well, what? He said, listen. I came to the Lord. I'm wanting to work in the ministry at my church. They did a background check. This showed up. I said, and the judge is like, are you serious? You, you went and turned yourself in? Yes, sir. That's why I'm here. He said, you know what? It is wiped clean. No charge is against you. But for the grace of God. 
Amen? But for the grace of God. He said, I commend you and to the, wor and to the word of his grace. Listen to that. And to the word of his grace. Say it. To the word of his grace. To the word of his grace. But let me, let me, I, I need us to all to understand something. It's not just his word to us. It is his word to humanity. It's his word to every man, every woman, and every child. It does not matter what they have done. It doesn't matter their current state. It doesn't matter the sins that they have committed. It does not matter. The word of his grace can bring wholeness, completeness, and restoration to them. Amen? It can bring it. We are to be those ministers of reconciliation. Sharing this word, he says, to the word of his grace, which is able to do what? It's able to build you up. It's able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. If you keep going down Jude 16, Jude only has, is, is just one chapter. Here's what, in Jude 16, listen, he's addressing some who would corrupt the church. It almost sounds like what Paul is writing to in Corinthians. Here's what he says. There are grumblers, complainers, walking around according to their own lust. They mouth great swelling words. They flatter people to gain advantage. He says, but you, beloved, remember the words that were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus. How they told you there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. These are sensual persons who cause division, listen to this, not having the Spirit. I, I want to tell you, this, there, when, when I said, I, I wish that there were pastors and prophets, and understand this, I'm not condemning any pastor, any prophet in, in today's society, I'm not. But I wish we had more people who were as patriotic as Patrick Henry was for the nation. I wish we had more pastors who were as patriotic for the kingdom of God that would just preach the word. Amen. Just preach the word. Just say what God says. Because I'm going to tell you something. It is what saves our soul. It's the word of God. It's the word of his grace. And yes, just like we understand. Patrick Henry said, look, this is going to be hard for you to hear. But I want you to hear this. The British are not backing off. If they were talking peace, they wouldn't be gathering an army. They're coming to enslave us. Do you all hear this? So grab your arms. <laughs> Men, grab your arms and be ready to defend yourself. Can I tell y'all something? The enemy is not going to cut a treaty with you. He's not about bargaining. He is gathering his demonic minions. Come on. And he is getting ready for an assault. And a final assault as the day grows closer to the coming of the Lord. But we don't need to harbor ourselves inside of a church building. And say, oh man, we better just hold on till Jesus comes. No, we need to ignite ourselves, grab up our arms, and go out and save every person that has the opportunity to hear the good news. You say, well, pastor, but what if they don't hear it? What if they don't understand it? Listen to me. I didn't understand it when people first shared it with me. I did not, but God's the one who brought it to me. God's the one who raised up the word of God in me. Understand this. I quoted a scripture that I didn't even remember that I remembered. Did y'all hear that? I didn't even remember I remembered. I, honestly, when I quoted it, I didn't even know it was a scripture. <laughs> Choose you this day who you will serve. Wow, I am loud. Is it gone? Yeah, it's gone. reverb off hold on 
small alien in my hand here. Set off. All right. That just means let's keep going here. All right. So here we go. Come on. Jude's addressing these people. Here he says, there are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. They run after their own lust. I want to share something with you. Jude was writing to the church. Did y'all hear me? He wasn't writing <laughs> to the heathen. He was writing to the church. He said, look, even among you, there are going to be tares. There are going to be those who try to ensnare you. There are going to be those who try to hold you back. Even those who are in your own congregations, they're going to be sensual. Had a pastor friend of mine, he and his wife were going through a very hard time. They did not finalize a divorce, but he moved to Florida. He started attending a singles ministry at a church. It doesn't matter what denomination. I told y'all, all, look, sin is across the board. It doesn't have a denominational label. The woman who was in charge of the singles ministry invited him to her home and propositioned him to sleep with him. That singles ministry. She had obviously been effective in some of her singles ministry before. He said, I couldn't believe it. I didn't ask him if he went. Did y'all hear what I just said? But he said, that's what happened. He was later reconciled to his wife, praise God. But here's what it says in verse 20 of Jude. It says this, maintain your life with God is the heading on this. But you, beloved, building your life selves up. Get ready. We're to build each other up, but who else are we to build up? Okay, so his word of grace comes. Amen? His word of grace comes. His word of grace is able to build us up. Can I, can I tell y'all something? Here, here's what. Because going through the words convicting. Just going through the word is convicting. Going through this First Corinthians the way that I'm doing, I've always wanted to do this, but I'm going to tell you something. You know, somebody said, wow, that was really good a few weeks back. And, you know, I think when Karen spoke, they were like, man, that was really good. You ought to let her do that more often. And, okay, I said, man, I really love to see how all the scriptures are tying together. But understand something. The reason that we don't do this a lot is because this is hard. Did you all hear me? Because now, understand something, Christianity is not a passive faith. It's not passive. It's personal. Amen? I've been married for 32 years. There would be times in our marriage where Karen and I would do what we would deem, and many of y'all may have done this too, we kind of cohabitated. We were in the same house, living together as a married couple, but weren't really acting like we were married. You know, that only happened for about two or three days or four days when life just got really busy and we're just like going bonkers. But it would take us like two or three weeks to kind of work through it, to get back to living that married life. Anybody here identifying with what I said? Some of y'all are like, no, it's just y'all. Oh, okay, well, good. Uh, that was good therapy for me. All right, so <clears throat> now that y'all have perfect marriages. <laughs> but I want you to see what Jude says. Understand something. Listen, for me to build you up, I have to be intentional about it. I do. I have to be intentional. For me to build you up, for me to write you a note, for me to call you, for me to pray for you, I have to be intentional about it. But guess what? You have to be intentional to build me up. You have to be intentional about it. He even says, hey, those who labor in the Word, you ought to share with them if you are growing. You ought to share with them the benefits. Why? So, because that helps them to understand, man, I'm doing something that matters. I reached out to a person who's over our denomination for the state of Georgia. I sent him a text the other morning. And I said, listen, I want you to know that you have communicated with me more than almost anyone else since I have been a pastor at this church. Thank you very much 
He sent me a text back. I didn't do it for this. He sent me a text back. He said, man, he said, I needed that right now. I needed that right now. I, I needed to hear that word of encouragement. Why? Because that built him up. But there's sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, where we're not going to have somebody around us to build us up. Did y'all hear me? You're not going to have somebody around you to build you up. So Jude addresses it. Get ready. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the, come on, praying in the Holy Spirit. And then he goes back to love. Keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Do you all hear that? Say praying. Come on, say it with me. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Say it again. Praying in the Holy Spirit. That means, Heavenly Father, and if you don't speak in tongues, if you haven't had the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, we'll pray for that this morning. All right? We will pray for that this morning. And even if you don't walk out of here speaking in tongues, you say, God, I'm coming to you and I'm asking you to tell me how to pray. I've got a situation right now. I've been praying for about three or four days over a situation that I personally have. It's a family situation. It's not a church situation. It's a family situation. And here's what I've asked. God, what I've been doing is not working. Therefore, I am asking you for the direction. All right? What I, who am I asking? I'm asking the Lord. How is he going to give that to me? He's going to give that to me by the Spirit. I believe that. So if you go, if you go and you say, hey, listen, I'm going to pray. You don't, you don't speak in tongues, but here's what you do. You get down on your knees and you say, God, I'm bringing this before you. And, Lord, I'm asking for the power of the Holy Spirit right now to teach me how to pray. The Word of God says this, that he will teach you how to pray. He will pray for you with groanings that cannot even be understood. Amen? It says the Spirit himself makes intercession on our behalf. Do y'all hear that? See, there's, there's prayers that we can pray, and we pray them good, don't we? Lord, give me a parking place. Come on. Father God, I need a sale. Lord, I'm going into this goodwill. I've been in it three times. Please let the right golf club be there for me. That's my prayer. All right. Here it is, though. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Then he says what? Keep yourselves in the love of God. You could take Jude. Verse 20, and you could make this, verse 20 and 21, and say, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Verse 22, I want you to see, I, 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 we can just spend all the time in the Word. Listen to what verse 22 says. And on some have compassion, making a distinction. Did y'all hear that? On some. Have compassion, making a distinction. Some have compassion, but make a distinction. Who's going to help us make a distinction? The Lord is. The Lord is. Now listen, we're not trying to go and find a demon behind every bush or a demon in every person. But there are some people who are demonically influenced. And the Lord will send up caution light. The Lord will send up, and listen to me. Now, Paul addresses this. He's talking about food sacrificed to idols in 1 Corinthians 8. I know y'all are like, he ain't even been in 1 Corinthians 8. Just hold on. That's, uh, that goes from 12 to 12.45. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But we could spend that much time in the Word. But when he, when, what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, understand this. In 1 Corinthians 8, he says, look, that food that is sacrificed to idols, we know that idols are nothing. That's what he says. We know that idols are nothing. But because some people are weak in their conscience and they don't understand that, we who are mature, we're to refrain from eating the food sacrificed to idols. We're not to do that. Then in 1 Corinthians 10, 
Paul addresses it again. Remember, he repeats it, but now he repeats it even more in detail. Here's what he says. Would those who have been saved by the God, the one true God, actually go and partake of food that has been sacrificed to idols and, listen, and sit at the table of demons? Did y'all hear that? He says, would you go from here? From 1 Corinthians 8, he says, we know idols are nothing. But then he brings in a spiritual thing here. So here, here I understand. On some have compassion, but on others make a distinction. Because there are some that we need to help, and there are others that we may need to stay away from. The Word of God says, lay hands quickly on no man. Do you all hear me? I'm not saying... I had a woman come into uh, my church, first church we were a part of. She came in on a Saturday night. We had Saturday evening prayer. I was, um, I saw her come in. I thought, hmm, who is she? She kind of walked in. She saw that we were gathered together for prayer. She walked out. Somebody came and said, Pastor, she's in the nursery talking to the nursery attendants. I walked in. I said, ma'am, can I help you? She said, I'm a prophetess. And you're running this all wrong. I said, I'm a pastor, and you need to leave my church. That's what I told her. I, you know, I, I'm not bold in a lot, but I said, no, I'm a pastor. I'm a prophet. I said, ma'am, you're not a prophetess here. You need to leave the church, or I'll call the police. She walked on out the door. Somebody said, pastor, what was that? I made a distinction. Did y'all hear me? She wasn't crazy. Well, I mean, give or take. But she was demonically inspired. Do you all hear that? I've been in this church before. I've been up here preaching and felt I knew it. I even told Karen before I went up, I'm telling you, somebody in here is not right. Somebody in here is not right. When I got up, I prayed when I was there. I said, honey, I just need you to pray. Just pray. Those are the times when I would say, hey, listen, if you're not right with God and you want to be, and I don't care what influence is over you, today is the day of salvation for you. And if you harden your heart, now listen, and I said this in a certain, if you harden your heart, I even told my son this the other day. I said, here's the sneaky thing about sin. I said, when you harden your heart the first time, it's hard to do it. The second time it's easier. The third time it's even easier. The fourth time you don't even realize you're hardening your heart. Because now you have become desensitized to the sin that you're committing. <laughs> you know, that's why spare the rod, spoil the child. If you can't keep them sensitive up here and in here, at least get them sensitive here. Amen? Come on. I'm going to build your sensitivity. Hallelujah. I'm going to transfer from here to your heart. Let's see how long and how hard I have to hit to get it there. Amen. Okay, some of y'all are going to say, you're going to be reported to Family and Children's Services. You're going to have to catch me. All right, here we go. And on some have compassion making distinction. And y'all hear me on this. I'll go by people, they're panhandlers who are out on the road. I'll go by them at times. I will help them. There have been times where I've stopped and given people money that I didn't even know and weren't asking for anything. But on others, I've made a distinction. Make a distinction. Ask the Lord to give you wisdom in that. But others, listen to this, save with fear. Pulling them out of the fire. Hating even the garment defiled by flesh. Here's the last thing I want to say. I hope we see we cannot do this without God's word, without God's spirit, without God's direction. We can't. We can't. And he goes on, and I thought of this scripture, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Worship team, come on. I'm, I'm about ready because, and y'all go ahead and stand with me. I'm going to read this scripture after you stand. Mm, wow. 1 Corinthians 8. I did. I got back to it. 1 Corinthians 8, verse number 2. Out of the Amplified. You ready? 
If anyone imagines that he knows and he and understands anything of divine matters without love, he has not yet known as he ought to know. Verse 3. But if anyone loves God, listen, with awe-filled reverence, obedience, and gratitude, he is known, boy, that's big, isn't it? He is known what? As his very own and as greatly loved. We ought to let this sink in. Listen to it. But if anyone loves God with all filled reverence, obedience, and gratitude, he is known by him and his very own, as his very own and as greatly loved. Listen to verse 2 again. Go back to 2. If anyone imagines that he knows and understands anything of divine matters without love, he is not yet known as he ought to know. It's not knowledge that builds up, it's love. Amen? But I'm telling you, when we fall in love with God, that's when I believe that his knowledge and his wisdom flows. Because here's what he said. He says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me for the rest of the days of my life, right? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me for all the days of my life. <laughs> I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and, and um, I mean, I'm 55, right? And he's 45. I wish we could trade ages sometimes, but... We can't. Lord. He's he's 45, I'm 55. And here's here's what he said. He said, hey, I said, hey, I'm really trying to work on my, and I've, I've told you all this. I said, I'm trying to work on my attitude, trying to work on. And he said, well, well, how's, how, how are you doing that? And And here's. Here's what I told him. I said, I am trying to slow down. Did y'all hear that? I'm trying to slow down. Now, I want you to think about this. and I'm just making a quick correlation, and then we're going to pray. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. But what if I am running so hard what if I'm pushing so hard that I don't even notice goodness and mercy? Did y'all hear me? That I don't even that I don't even take the time to acknowledge that. Okay, it, same thing can happen in my relationship with my wife. If I'm going so hard all week, push, do this, push, do this, push, do this, then guess what? I can forget. I can do the same thing with my kids. I'm pushing, 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 pushing. And, you know, and I'll, I'll hear it when my son will say, hey, you know, we hadn't hung out in a while. Now, when I ask him to hang out, he doesn't want to. <laughs> Which means that he does want to. But surely goodness and mercy, they're always following us. But if we're running so fast, we're not going to catch them. We're not going to let them catch up with us. We're not going to feel the effect of that goodness, the effect of that mercy. Now, here's the other thing. I, I do want to pray for you for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Listen to me. It's a very simple prayer. If you're saved, if you've been born again, if you've been saved, if you've been born again, first off, you have the Spirit of God dwelling within you. Secondly, that's a gift. It is. It's a gift of the Spirit. Paul said, I pray with understanding and I pray in the Spirit. I sing with understanding and I sing in the Spirit. It's not just a gift for the edification of the body. Jude even addressed it in his book. It is, in his chapter, it is a gift to edify yourself. How do I pray? I pray in the Spirit and I pray with my understanding. One of the best ways is when I was praying for someone and I didn't know what to pray and I felt like, well, I'll just pray in the Spirit. I started praying in the Spirit in kind of a language that I'd never prayed in before. 
You say, well, it's unintelligible, so how do I know? Well, Jesus said rivers of living water will flow from within, okay? That's how you know. You know, because it comes from here. It comes from here. Yeah, it, it'll gush forth, I promise you. You say, well, Pastor, I ain't even been baptized in water. Hey, neither hit Cornelius' house. Peter goes in, preaches the word of God, Spirit, Holy Spirit falls. All those who were in Cornelius' house, Gentiles, had never heard about this before. Received the baptism in the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave evidence. And they were speaking the mysteries and the glories of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, Heavenly Father, we come. Because, God, we know we cannot do this without you. We cannot do this without you. So, Lord, we're asking you now to baptize people in the Spirit, Lord God. Heavenly Father, to fill them to overflowing. Lord, I pray that the initial physical evidence of that baptism, Lord, will flow forth. Lord, as people yield themselves to you and yield themselves to your spirit. And Father God, I just pray that it will flow like a river. And Lord God, as we worship, Lord, we also come, God, because we're just asking you to help us to slow down. Heavenly Father, to be discerning. To be so filled with the spirit, Heavenly Father, that we're able to distinguish Heavenly Father, between those that we have compassion on, those that we reach out to quickly, Lord, and those, God, that we are to refrain from, at least now for this season. So, Father God, we're coming, Lord, because we want to be whole. We want to be complete. We want to be filled, Heavenly Father. And listen to me, that word fill means continually. So maybe you received the baptism in the Spirit before, but you haven't flowed in that for a while. I want to tell you something. You need to reopen that well. Amen? In Jesus' name. Because you need to be filled continually. Over and over and over again. You say, Pastor Tim, I've been to the altar 25 times. Pray for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I have not felt that evidence or seen the evidence as of yet. Listen to me. God it will not, He will give you the Spirit. And I'm trusting that it might be today, it may be next week, it may be in three months. But I'm going to tell you something. You come again. Don't refrain from receiving everything that God has for you. Hey, this altar's open. I'm going to ask for our altar workers to come. File across the front. They're going to pray for you. Just lift your hands to the Lord Jesus and say, God, I'm coming in Jesus' name. Come on. This altar's open. Thank you, Lord.